Alrighty, welcome everyone. I'm Tiaboo and I am back for more Princess Chuchu. It's not Tutu, it's Chuchu because there isn't really a Toot, there's only a Toot, and so it's Chuchu, which is the cutest thing ever. And we are here for episode Tweet Tweet, which doesn't make any sense at all. God damn it. Ah. <sighs> Okay, I want to do a couple of housekeeping things before we actually talk about what we saw last week, and then we will go from there and move into the next episode and continue on. But, housekeeping things. First off, I'm going to be making a more significant video about this, but my tea jar exploded, so I got a new one. Um, this is temporary, I will say, and I am currently on in the market slash looking for a, a custom potter, preferably potter as in person who makes things out of clay, um, not hairy. Uh, a <laughs> uh, custom potter who would be willing to do a commission piece that would be functional. Um, if you happen to know a potter, let me know. Hit me up in DMs or Discord or just message me on Patreon. I think you can do that without paying me money. You don't have to pay me money or anything. But if you have that information, I mean, throw me a comment or something. Send me links. I don't care. I'll, I'll find somebody on Etsy if nobody helps me find something. But I want to throw this out there and just be like, hey, you want to help me get a new tea jar thing? That would be chill. Yeah, so I, I want to get a commissioned, like, a 30-ounce-ish, uh, you know me. So a handleless Japanese style clay fired mug, um, preferably in a greenish glaze if possible. If there are possibilities for like an, a, a monogram on it, like a T or something, then I'd be down for that and I'd be willing to pay quite a bit for it. So if you've got any friends who are struggling artists and or ceramics makers who would be down for a commission piece of work that would maybe help pay the bills slash buy groceries during the pandemic, which is really weird, uh, let me know and, and throw their name my way and and, or throw my name their way or whatever, and maybe they'll like it. I don't know. Maybe we'll get something going. Okay, that's housekeeping thing number one. Housekeeping thing number two is the number of episodes that I'm watching per week. A lot of people have been clamoring for more than one episode per week, and I will simply say this. It is never outside of the realm of possibility on my channel for me to watch more than one episode per week. I will always, however, play it by ear. Um, I'm not going to like commit to two episodes or one episode or whatever. It's always going to be played by ear. So far in Princess Tutu, we've only had two episodes, which is not a huge sample size, but so far in Princess Tutu, each episode has been an absolute banger with a shitload to talk about and by the time of about two hours of talking about uh, uh story stuff and like trying to wrap my head around weird meta things i get drained and i like making good content and being awake and like energized and ready and good to go is is something that's necessary for me to make good content i think uh so if the episodes become more simple and more straightforward and we get into what feels like a rhythmic arc, which is totally possible because, as I said multiple times in the previous episode, uh, we just got a structural setup, but we'll get into that in a little bit. If we do that, get that kind of more simplistic story beat arc thing, then maybe we'll watch more than one episode per week. But I have a feeling that even if we do that, there's going to be so much intricacy and subtext and weird symbolism and like stuff around it that it's going to be a lot to investigate anyway. All I mean to say by that is I'm not going to commit either way. Stop asking, though, because you're like it. It doesn't affect my decision making process. My decision making process on that is entirely based on the show and what I have to talk about it. Um, I, I, I always say this, but I watch anime and then I talk about it for as long as I feel like talking about it. And then I stop. And the same goes for the number of episodes that I watch. I watch it until I feel like I can't anymore. And then I stop. So. Yes, that makes for weird breakpoints. Yes, that makes for things that end up being conjecture in the end of episode two that we'll probably find out in the first 30 seconds of episode three because that's how this show is working right now, and that's totally fine. It's a little bit closer to the weekly viewing experience. Not that I necessarily think that the weekly viewing experience is something that should be held up on a pedestal. I think it's pretty shit in general. But the ability to let some time pass and allow episodes to simmer in the back of your head can be very, very valuable, especially with a piece of media that is seemingly as dense as Princess Tutu has been so far. Because this thing is like a fucking, what's the kind of the 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 kind of cake that's like just a, a 
brick that people never actually eat, but they give to each other in, on Christmas. Fruitcake. It's like a fruitcake. It's full of lots of intricate little gems of dried things and crystallized whatever, and it's super dense, and it's all in a really dense, really pretty-looking wrapper, but you don't want to eat more than a very small slice of it because fuck, that shit is rich. Um, that's actually a really good analogy. I may, maybe I should go with something better, like a German chocolate cake, so that it's more enticing, because nobody fucking likes fruitcake. If you like fruitcake, I don't know what's wrong with you. I really don't. I, I, don't, I just don't understand. It's like pineapple and pizza. It's like, why? What? Why? Okay. Princess Tutu. We're on episode Tree Tree. Ah, fuck. I said the same joke again. Oh, my God. All right. Uh, I wrote down a bunch of things after going through the episode earlier this morning, and I think those are all really useful. All right. We got a change to the opening monologue thing, which makes me think that the opening monologues are going to be continuously changing, and we will have to wait and see until... I press play to, to find that out. Uh, shattered shards. Yeah. Uh, the prince's heart has now been shattered. That's a bit of a change to the way that we were told it was before, or at least an elaboration. I do think it's more a change, and we'll talk about that. Um, why is the city weird? Uh, because the heart shards are everywhere, and they fuck things up and make things all wonky, I guess. Um, okay, at this point, I immediately got the impression that our story is perhaps more of a living document than a set-in-stone story. And there's a bit of an element of what Drosselmeyer does physically later with, in his meeting with Ahiru that leans into that kind of an impression for me. Now, I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of Drosselmeyer for a little while because I think Adel is taking his place, but we're going to talk about that too. Again, it's nice to have a week to simmer on these things because you come up with stuff that you wouldn't have before, and also people in my audience can like reach out to me and tell me stuff that I got wrong or cool additional things that are interesting. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah. So, <sighs> duck is duck. Never forget. Drosselmeyer is a bit of a creep. Drosselmeyer in episode two, there's this way, and I've gone back and I've rewatched the scene and I still don't know why I get this impression so strongly. Um, but as he's like, he's scribbling in his floating mechanical briefcase book that's crazy, but he's scribbling in it while staring at Ahiru and just going, yes, yes, and and you will be the one to save the prince. For the prince was was this and that and and Princess Chuchu is, must be the only one. And what I get is the impression of like, uh, somebody in a story meeting going like, well, maybe this would work as a story beat. Maybe this would work and like testing things out, but he's actually writing it into stone, right? He's writing it into the world, which is <laughs> big stuff. Anyway, duck is duck. Never forget. Drosselmeyer is, is creepy and writing stuff. Drosselmeyer gives her the pendant, and after kind of grilling her about her resolve and her willingness to, I think, sacrifice things in order to save the prince who she loves, because that makes the story, uh, gives her the pendant and tells her that she can do the thing, and then disappears, and she's back to a duck, and then Adel appears. Okay, let's talk about Adel. Uh, somebody messaged me telling me, because I said that I wanted to go and look up Adel and see if they were in any fairy tales, somebody messaged me telling me that Adel is the name of the grandmother from Cinder- or of the fairy godmother from Cinderella. She- she disguises herself as a normal person in the original fairy tale and comes into their house to work as a, a like, maid alongside Cinderella and figure out what the stepmothers and shit are all up to just to get a lay of the land, but also to present herself in a more approachable fashion before morphing Cinderella into the great princess that she appears to be during the one night. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? One, the Cinderella connection in, uh, yeah, all Ahiru's whole thing is a Cinderella story in a sense, right? Uh, just multiple layers below it because she's a duck. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot. But... I went ahead and I looked into this as much as I could, and I could find zero reference to a character named Adel in the Cinderella, Cinderella story. If somebody can find an actual text that has that information in it or anything, then I'm down um, and I'll believe it, but, but I can't find that anywhere except in reference to Princess Tutu. So I don't buy it, uh, but it works. It works perfectly, so I, I don't care. I'm just going to go with Adel is noble. However... I think Adel is also a fucking automaton because there is no way that she makes sense. Uh, she just she she's wonky, and we shoot her really wonky, and we shoot her like she's mechanical, and we like 
all of her actions are super hyper mechanical and everything. She also knows Ahiru already when she appears. She speaks as a narrator of sorts, like giving these grand opening statements, particularly the statement, may those who accept their fate be granted happiness, may those who defy their fate be granted uh, uh, glory. That's pretty interesting as like a dichotomy of choice and the result of those choices and i wonder how that's going to play into the story because it seems like a big like here's an outline of what we're going to do i don't know maybe we'll have one character accept their fate and one deny it being granted happiness and glory separately or not i don't really know uh she i assume is drosselmeyer's insertion of himself into the story which if the adel connection is real Drosselmeyer is the fairy godmother, and Adel is the the more familiar, more human form that the fairy godmother takes in order to approach Cinderella and find out what's going on. So that kind of works as like, hey, this is a creation of Drosselmeyer's that is executing Drosselmeyer's will, but is separate and more approachable despite being automatic. That's that's kind of cool, kind of neat. Okay, um, there's this clock. And it's in CG, and it strikes me as really interesting. Ha, strikes, because it's a clock. Dong, dong, ha, ha, ha. Uh, it strikes me as really interesting because it's in CG and because it's very detailed in particular. There were four elements on the clock that came out when it did a spinny thing. One of them was a bird. One of them was a knight with a sword and I think a shield and like a helmet and stuff. One of them was a prince and one was seemingly a princess. Prince and princess dancing above, knight and bird uh, spinning below them alone. I'm going to stick with the presumption, though there's no real evidence for it, that up top are Rue and uh, Muto, or Muto and somebody else, I don't fucking know, uh, and the bird is maybe Ahiru, and the, the knight is maybe Fakir, because a duty-bound knight who, who is real big sad uh, fits Fakir pretty well, maybe. Uh, so we get, we get the clock thing. We get some awk things where uh, Ahiru tries to girl uh and it goes it goes badly and it's it's extremely enjoyable and much fun to laugh at her struggles it's it's very good uh we discover quite quite a bit about the prince uh which is that there's nothing inside him he's he's an empty shell boy he is he is the saddest of the sads and uh he can't even be sad or disappointed because he doesn't actually have those feelings he's just like huh. i'm i'm essentially a vegetable who's real pretty and can dance. That's, that's who Muto is at the moment. He is a, a vegetable without emotions, essentially. And that's rough. Uh, Muto is also reading a particular book, which just happens to be Prinzund Rabe, which is pretty fucking interesting that the unfinished book that Drosselmeyer was writing from which Muto, Muto escaped uh, 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 is in the world. It's, it's just in the world. It's just there, and he can read it. And I would really like to know what's in it. I don't think it matters. But that's pretty fucking cool. Okay, then we meet Auntie Darina, and that part of the story occurs. Auntie Darina is super jealous of Rue because Rue's really good at the dancey thing. Rue says a particular line that's like, it's impossible for you, which makes me think that maybe Rue's got some weird shit going on that's weirder than her normal, just like, I'm the, the bitch, I'm, I'm the bad boss bitch, uh, queen of whatever, suck it. Uh, but it, it makes me think that there might be something a little bit more sinister going on there, or maybe just like a trade that she's made in the past with somebody for some reason, I don't know, in order to get her talents and stuff. And then we hit our structural beats. So, Auntie Darina bad. Uh, Auntie Darina has been essentially half-possessed by a fragment of Muto's heart shard, which is disappointment and bitterness. And we fight her, we literally dance away the pain, and then the pain goes into Muto and, and he gets even more sad. Uh, but he's happy that he can feel sad because, you know, feeling things is nice. I would love to know if there are any positive emotional shards. That would be cool if we could give him some, I don't know, like childish naivete or or joy, or, uh, uh, I don't know, fucking anything good that isn't, like, ah, depression. Ah, this part of my heart shard is anxiety. Ooh. Because, frankly, I've got enough of those on my own, I don't need a show giving me more of them. But if it wants to investigate them and be interesting about it, I'm down. Okay, things to keep up, keep, keep an eye out for in this episode. Uh, weird animal characters, 
is the next heart shard recipient also an animal character? Are all of the characters who are weird or have something weird going on animal characters? I don't know. I don't know. Um, clock. Anything about Rue. Literally anything about Rue, I'll take it. Uh, anything about Fakir, because that's, like, so central and core, and I really think it's Fakir's reflection in the pond at the end of the ED, and that means a lot if it's true. Uh, because that would imply that Fakir is the only one who would, like, go to her and discover that she is a duck, right? Because he's standing there at the pond right? Standing, like, looking at her as a duck, so maybe they'll make an actual connection as, like, people, uh, because she can't make a connection with Muto because he's a fuckboy. I really think Muto is going to become a fuckboy and become super evil, and I'm kind of looking forward to it because that feels like a very Just Desserts situation. And also, for a man like Drosselmeyer, who seems to have a little bit of a sadistic streak, and more importantly, seems to be entirely and completely and solely focused on telling or having told a great story, he's a character who's a lot more interested in a story of consequences and turmoil, and you, this naive child who thought you were saving something, oh, you foolish girl, you actually created the, the like, means of the world's destruction. How hilarious, how ironic. Very, very much the kind of vibe that I get from Drossmeyer, that he'd be just like, yeah, that's my kind of story. Why? Because it's my kind of story. I like fucked up stories sometimes. I get comments about this all the time. All the time. I got a comment like a week and a half ago on, on one of the finale episodes of Vinland Saga. Like, why are you like smiling and cackling at a character death here? This character death has been built up for 20 episodes. Do you not care? It's like, no, I do care. That's why I'm smiling. I'm happy that the story's good. I care more about stories than the fictional characters within them. I care about the quality of the story. So, sure, I will cackle and laugh and be excited by the, the, the awesome, badass death of a character. And if you saw Vinland Saga, you probably know which one I mean. There are two. You can pick and choose whichever one you want. They're, that, my reaction to them was basically the same because I was excited by those character deaths. They were good. They moved the story in awesome directions. They were intriguing. And so I vibe with Drosselmeyer on this front, and I think I can turn a little bit of my own like fictional sadism. I have zero desire to hurt people or things or anything, but pain is a part of life and suffering is a part of life. And I think stories that that divest themselves of those things, that ignore suffering and pain in order to tell a purely frou-frou story are rough and don't work that well. Even, even I'll bring it up again because I'm probably going to bring it up in every single fucking episode of this show, even Precure, which is hyper-positive in its outlook, deals with depression and guilt and shame and, and like personal human struggles all the time. Characters don't always get what they need. They usually do because it's a happy ending type of tale, but there are some characters that get genuinely fucked over and do not get, uh, d d do not get saved by the Precures. Usually the ending villain gets embraced and, like, saved by kindness. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's just, fuck you. So... Those, those things are necessary, and that kind of pain and stuff is necessary, especially for a good story, because it makes it more real, makes it more relatable, because there's only, there's only really one part of the human condition that's truly universal, and that is that we all suffer, all of us, no matter what. And that's not a negative outlook, that's a positive outlook. Like, we all suffer, we all die, our time is limited, okay, so, so be it. Choose your suffering. What are you willing to suffer for? What do you have the resolve to suffer for? That's an interesting story because it's the story of every human being who decides that they're willing to suffer to create something, to, to do something, to help someone, whatever it is, right? All right. That got kind of meta deep, and that's totally okay. I like going deep like that. Um, I am a little wonky this morning just in terms of my mental state. I don't know why. I just woke up feeling weird. <laughs> but... We're ready to go for some Princess Tutu. Uh, so things to keep an eye out for. The clock, Fakir stuff, Rue stuff. Does Mewtwo, Mewtwo express emotions at any point to any degree? And how, if he does, how does that affect uh, Ahiru? Because Ahiru is infatuated from afar, not actually knowing Mewtwo. And we just found out that there's nothing to know about Mewtwo at the moment. 
So if he starts being like bitter and disappointed because that's the only emotion he has at the moment, how's that going to make Ahiru feel about him? And are we going to get to know any of that or see her expressions and find out any of that? I don't know. I think that might be really interesting, though. Also, is Drosselmeyer anywhere, or is it just Adel? Do we have any more hints that Adel is automatic? Does Adel say any more extremely vague but obviously important lines? Hmm. Only one way to find out. So, let's dive on into this introduction, find out if it has changed once more, see if there is another heart shard causing havoc, uh, see what kind of creature or person it is attached to, and why, and hopefully dance the pain away. So... Let's go for Princess Tutu, Episode 3. I've got it up and ready. Sit in zero seconds. There'll be two versions. Picture-in-picture picture version. Description. Timer-based version. YouTube. Beep-beep timer. Nailed it. <laughs> Where's my mouse? Okay. Is it usually silent for that long? Okay, we're back to the first line. Never mind. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Ebin? Ebine? Ebin? Ebine? E-B-I-N-E? I'm just Googling that. That's it. E-B-I-N-E. Uh, Ebin Yamaji is a Japanese manga artist who's created several works with a lesbian theme. Nope. Nope. Don't think so. Sorry, I am looking away during the OP. Yeah, okay, so no reference, really. Just somebody named Ebin. Ebin? Ebiny? Uh -huh. I'm gonna shut up. This is too pretty. Pardon. God, that portion is just so insanely good. Okay. Dorn Russian Panorama. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, hands off, hands off. Oh my god. I just oh my god. Uh they're the stepsisters. They're not evil, but they are her stepsisters functionally. Oh, Ahiru never will amount to anything. Ahiru will never do anything. Uh -huh. <laughs> Spill Oh. Interesting dream. Sounds like this book that Muta has been reading. How weird. Mm. 
Mhm. Mhm. Ah! <laughs> Excuse me? Wait, did they just take the book? No, 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 give me that! Fuck! Oh, no, he's dead. Oh, my God, that shot. Everything tumbling down. Whoa, ho, ho. So why is it published? Why is it published and finished? How is it published and finished? Uh-huh. Yeah. But why, how is the book here? Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Sure. Well, yeah, he's, yeah, sure. Wonder if she's out of a story because she's fucking pretty perfect too. Mewtwo Senpai! Never forget that. Hello, Fakir? Ah. Oh. Did he now? Say something. Oh, whoa. <laughs> I love him. I'm, uh, he's really growing on me. I think he does. Oh, I think he certainly... Hmm. You know, his... Uh, you know, his... Is your roommate... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sure. I I believe you completely, Fakir. <laughs> Whoa. All of this framing, man. Ah, oh, she's gonna go follow them? Maybe end up at that creepy cottage in the woods? Maybe meet a witch or something? Hi, Adel! Oh, we just- we just hear her? Oh, fuck that. Absolutely. Perfectly clear. Uh-huh. 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 Uh huh. Nope. Oh. What? No, no, no. Oh, what? Uh, we're gonna look that up because that sounds like a thing. Nice picnic. Nice shot. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Oh, hide. Hiding time. Wow, the one flowering tree. Oh my god, finally. No, 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 no. Shut up. Oh, that's weird. Oh, that's weird. She knows he doesn't. Just likes being doted upon? Oh, my God. Huh? 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 Are? Whoa, that cut. 8.30 shoes. You'd freak the fuck out. And probably quack.
<laughs> Just faster each time. Hi, Fakir, probably? Nope, Muto, hi. No. <laughs> Hello, dark thing in the corner. Interesting framing. Oh, no. That's a different response. Oh, shit. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. He doesn't feel pain? <gasps> he doesn't understand emotion. <laughs> Weird face, though. No, they do not. but literally cannot feel physical pain. Well, uh, at what? Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't tell you. Time to run. It's gonna have to go get more water. Or Rue's gonna come looking. Ah. <laughs> you are the gooberist, and I love you. That house? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Oh, hello. Oh, it's a restaurant. Probably. Okay, she's nice. She's great. I love her. Awesome. Ah. Ah. It's like a fucking One Piece character. And she has not had guests in a while. Okay. She is very scary, but very likable. I'm sure she's fine. Does she? She has a void in her heart. She has a a, a, a shard. You had yeah. I heard that glimmer. Ah. Glimmer gleam. Something just responded. Yeah. Oh, hi, Rue. Um. Oh, hi, Fakir. Um. Fire and wind day. Eh? What did you do? Wait, they know. They, they're in this together? Well, nope. I would not eat that, actually. I'm sure it's really delicious. They're all cold and tasteless? She can't make food. That's great, but she can't make flavor. And it's, it's cursed. So then what feeling is that? And they're all cold and flavorless. And Mewtwo just doesn't even consume them. 
It is, I just put the thing in my face and I'm not. Um, um. Whoa. <laughs> oh, God. Darling, darling, please no. <laughs> please ignore the superhero who comes out after me. I'm just going to click Kent it up really quick. <laughs> Is she full witch? No. Nah. 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 This is this is this is nice. This this is a nice setup for a, a fun butcher shop murder thing going on here, but no. <sighs> Yes. Yeah, Hansel and Gretel. Or many others. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think too that she is a good, well-meaning person who is desperate to try to, like, reclaim her ability. All these recipes that she cares about. <gasps> a husband lost. He was the chef. Uh-oh. Losing him, losing the passion for food. Yeah. Okay. Huh? That darkness, like, just encroaching from the corner... Choo choo time, choo choo time. Oh fuck! Ah! 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 Pure heart that just wants to feed people and be good, but lost her husband, I think. Lost her love. And so it became an obligate. Oh wow! Blingly blonk! Is a different track for the music. Oh my god. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, let's dance, baby. <laughs> uh, is he seeing this? Okay, then. That works. No. This is tragic now. Because it is. You have to learn you have to learn to love other things in your life though. Amongst the thorns. To what end? Back and forth, back and forth. What is he? Which is he? Yeah. They're just manifesting boats. And expressing it all through dance. Fuck. <laughs> that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hmm. It's a good setup for the, 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 yeah. 
Oh, she wasn't. Okay, it wasn't murder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the flavor of the passion isn't. Okay, so she regains the ability to cook. Does Mewtwo gain the ability to taste it? <sighs> Ow. Yeah, go, go back to the sad boy. Oh, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> no, no, no. You won't be alone. You'll have customers. Aww. Whoa. Whoa. She as a human gets that power to turn loneliness into strength. Does Muto? I believe you. I believe you. Okay. Don't go. Don't leave me alone. Whoa. Whoa. That's new. Bye bye. All right, Rue and Fakir. Good job. Go eat food. Oh, hi. Go hide. <laughs> Bitch, what? <laughs> in, in, yeah, never mind. That's not good. <laughs> of course. Shit. Asshole. Asshole. Ha 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 ha. Fuck you, Dross. I'm going to try it because I can't remember the exact phrasing of it, but I'm going to try to find the, the like wind fire trees thing that they were talking about. That Adel was talking about. Nope. Nope, nope. Nope, nope, nope. 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 
Okay, uh, I'm looking for the, the, the fire wind trees thing that is talked about, and I can't find it. So I, I, I'm going to go I'm gonna go look for the exact phrasing of it, because I, I feel like that's interesting. And I, I feel like a good move for us moving along into the future would be to start with whatever was most poignant that, uh, that Adel said, because those seem to be like narrative points that matter. Um, so let me go find that. And then I, I want to see if there's any like link between that and reality. You know, is that a real thing in any way? Where are you, Adel? There you are. Okay. Uh, that person is a good friend. Person's friends aren't friends with one another, but you don't know that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Wind makes flames burn and treetops sway. How fire behaves. Tips for estimating wind speeds. If I fire the... You know. Nope. Nope. Not a, like, not a saying, I guess. But flames burn trees to the ground. And wind can increase the... What? Who? Who's wind and who's flame and who's trees? I don't know. I actually don't know. Unless the fire is love and, and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's fucking weird. Um, There are a lot of weird lines in this episode. Okay. Um, What I'm going to do instead of anything else is I'm going to do a, uh, like, a basic quick overview thoughts before doing any reinvestigation. Then I'm going to go import this into my editor so that we can move through it more easily. Then we're going to talk through it a lot and also look at a bunch of cuts um yeah okay general thoughts prunzun rabe what the fuck a uh, lot more information about the book tutu or, or ahiru now knows about the story and its existence and the weirdness going on here and knows that she is interacting with partly storybook characters in her world now and is now actively questioning by herself what is real and what is not in my world That's fucking cool, because those are my questions, and now our character's asking them, which means we're probably going to eventually get answers to them, kind of. Not the way that we want, but it's gonna be further along the line. Oh boy, that's amazing. Uh, the whole, like, putting books on her head and making her stand tall thing was was pretty fun, teaching, teaching people how to princess. Nice. I uh, finally realized that her two friendo girls, um, her two friendo girls, they're the evil stepsisters, aren't they? And, and purely terms of what they're doing in the story, they don't actually, like, play an important role so far. They're just there to comment and talk about what her stuff is, but they are constantly undercutting her, telling her she's not good enough, uh, saying that she'll never amount to anything, saying that she'll never get out of the probationary class, saying that she doesn't deserve anything, saying that she's worthless. They're the evil stepsisters. They are, at present, not evil. However... We did get a shot of them that had a very different vibe to it, didn't we? Maybe they are more sinister than I thought. I don't think intentionally so. It's when she brings up... Drosselmeyer. Yeah, that. Klong. Nani. Oh man, and then throughout this whole sequence, all of these times that she's framed within these, these like, isolating or confining geometric shapes and patterns, um, also confining her within the wheel, right? Like, the, the gear that she ends up circled by when she's locked into Drosselmeyer's machinations into another beat of the story that she's forced into. That's, that's, that's right there, right now, in that window, it's the same thing. The, the clock and the stained glass are all the same. Although it has 16 sections because it's, you know, divided evenly, so whatever. <laughs> There's the whole thing with Ruin Fog here. We find out so much more about Ruin Fog here, and also nothing. Oh my god. And then the eventual, like, individual story that's told here of the loneliness of this woman who owned a restaurant with her husband and then lost her husband and can't replicate the recipes. They turn out cold and heartless because she is so so deeply sad and alone wow 
And what we do is we don't fix her loneliness. That's also really cool. We do not fix her loneliness. We take away the the overbearing loneliness that is not hers, and then she is able to struggle herself and, like, fight it by working on herself, like, working toward the thing that she knows she loves. That's fucking cool as a way of fixing the thing because we do not fix Ebeen. We, we don't, right? We just take away the prince's extra from her. She's still sad, still grieving, but she can get over it. Wow, it can start sealing up that that void in her heart now that the the like alien artifact is gone. And I don't mean like alien, I mean alien foreign body is removed. Wow. We discover that Muto can literally not feel pain. The extent to which he is a vegetable is much larger than we thought. He also cannot self-actualize, it seems, or choose to do anything or whatever, which makes perfect sense. If you have no, if you have no, like, desire for anything that would pull you towards something and no, like, fear or pain or whatever that would push you away from something, then where are you going? You're not going anywhere. So he just takes orders. <sighs> wow. And Rue seems to delight in bossing him around i wonder if that's sinister or just kind of being a little bit of a bitch um i kind of get the feeling that she's just a little bit of a bitch at this point now uh, i don't know fakir on the other hand seems to be very much like stay in your room so you don't kill yourself accidentally by just like doing something stupid or eating infinite amounts of food because nobody told you to stop or jumping into water and forgetting to breathe and or whatever right like he's pretty fed up with this shit that's the feeling that I get from Fakir. He's he's feel pretty fed up with this shit. Okay. Uh water and stuff. Yeah, dish is cold. Don't know what's the deal with the boats. I love this character's character design. I love a bean's character design. Uh it's a it's a really neat one to me because she is I think fairly obviously from the outset this is this is not a strikingly beautiful woman or anything, right? Which plays into the maybe she's a witch, right? She's a bit homely. She's a weird-looking woman, right? She's got big eyes and a kind of a kind of like elongated face and a, a way too big mouth that's very delighted and and delightful, but also a little unnerving. Kind of kind of like Angelina Jolie. You look at Angelina Jolie, it's like yeah, she's she's cute, but that's a lot of mouth. Wow. Or you look at Sam Regal and it's just like the bottom half of his entire face is just teeth. And it's like, oh, huh, oh, buddy, please don't eat me. Um, I'm, I'm joking to an extent, but I think I think I do have a point here. When Abin opens the door and this is the first thing that we see of her. One, she looks like a One Piece character. Um, super simplified nose, big round circular eyes, uh, big, big oversized smile that takes up way too much of her face tight bun hair pulled back right this is a, a homely woman who stays alone and doesn't go out much but is delighted to see people here and all of that i think is evident immediately in her character design and i just want to point that out because it's fantastic i think during the reaction because we we play into she's creepy right so when she bursts to the door it's like a creepy eye at the door right Hi? Yes? Somebody? Anybody? Anyone? Person? 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 Yes? Creepy, right? Way too creepy. But then the door opens and we see the smile and... <sighs> oh. She's a little much. But she means well. And so I held on to that precise impression throughout her story. Even though we do get these, like, darkness in the shadows thing, darkness in the corners things pretty frequently, which very clearly indicate to us that Ahiru feels uncomfortable here. And, I mean, we go hard on it, like, shading out her face and more and the looming darkness in a corner every frame at every point. Yikes. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Look at that cut. The I think the thing that sells it more than I mean it's really well done just in terms of the animation itself. Just like the 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 jumping through during the OP scene. But the 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 three portions that are the background. So there's the wall behind going this way. And then there's the trees going this way, and then the, the floor, and it all comes together to feel like we're walking and moving. That's super dope. Because that, that sh that, this, sh this shot was immediately just like, whoa, what's going on? It's so quick, and then it's gone. Wow. 
Wow. Oh no, I write I wrote down eighteen ten camera. What did I what did I want with the camera at eighteen ten? Oh I know. She reaches out and then the camera does a pan and 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 move like in this way. On an arc. Yeah, right here. She goes reach and then we go tilt. Ah, oh, I love it. Just create, just creativity in the visuals. Just yes, love it. Gosh, creating a little cage of vines for. There's so much weird shit in this episode. There's so much weird shit in this episode. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, I'm gonna have to import this into my editor. I'm gonna go do that because um, I need to go through the whole thing. Okie dokie. I'm, 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 I'm gonna do that. Cut here. See you in a minute. Well, I just had a, a pretty cool thought. This is I'm still waiting for the the thing to to go. But as I was doing so, I started going through the the introductory monologue thing just to look at the the way that everything was said. So the prince had his heart, his kindness, and his memories stolen. But the crucial thing is the one that fits so perfectly into that like, heart flower wilting type of magical girl thing that we talked about last week. Um, the voids in the heart that are necessary for the shards to to take control or take some something, right? That's fucking cool. Because it's not just that there are voids in the heart. This, like, this, it's everything, right? One's own tale, one's own real-world story can be twisted by shards and, like knowledge gleaned from other stories and if those stories or the shards of them are broken or misinterpreted they can have really terrible influence stories ha matter right and this is so core to my general beliefs about media that it's kind of fucking like oh shit we're gonna like this stories matter and the things that we learn from stories affect us stories have influence outside of their pages and thus authors are immortalized by their works outside of their works i think that the the phrase that we often use is uh authors are immortalized in their works but i that's not true right they're immortalized by their works outside of their works so draw some wire is and in a way, all of the everything that's going on is just the dead draw some effect on this world kind of but also not Ooh, that's cool that's kind of neat. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go finish because the thing just updated, so I'll, I'll be back. Huh. I, I just went to look up the episode director and storyboard and stuff just for fun and realized something that I haven't really noticed before. Just that the, the way the episode scripts and storyboards and episode direction are spread out is more, like, evenly spread out than literally any show I've ever seen. Okay, to, to give you an example, Junichi Sato is the chief director. Junichi Sato storyboarded the OP, episode 1, 7, 9, 13, 15, 19, 22, 26. Like, three to four-ish episodes between each one that he directed. Kyoko Sayama directed 3, 8, 10, 12, 16, 17, 20, 21, 24. A couple more, like, packed together, but... Still really well spread out over the entire series. Next, Shogo Kawamoto, 2, 4, 11, 14, 18, 23, 25. And then two other individuals, one uh, directed only one episode, episode 6, and one directed episodes 5 and 9. I'm sorry, those are storyboards. And then the episode direction is even more spread out. That's really cool, and it strikes me as, like, a good idea. It, it, it's weird to just try to glean this kind of information from just the ANN page, but seeing that gives me the vibe of a really good delegation. Really, really, really good strategic planning. And that's fucking cool and makes me very confident in the show going forward, so that, that's super neat. Okay, um, and then I do want to look at the episode director, because this one was... Scripted by Yokote and storyboarded by Kyoko Sayama and directed by Matsuo Asami. Oh, Kyoko Asama is uh, Sayama is wife of animator Tetsuya Kumagai. Oh, he's like a lot. Cool. I really like this episode. I think there was just really good everything and a lot of awesome use of color and shadow and and emotional conveyance all the way through. It was super neat. Okay, I'm still doing the thing on on my editor. Get let me do this and then we'll actually get to it. Cut again.
All right, we are good to go to go through and talk about Princess Chichi number two or number three. Uh, I did just skim it at ultra super hyper speed and then like write down a bunch of stuff. Let us go from here. Okay, we open with the same line as before. There once upon a time there was a man who died. Let me uh, move the subs up a little bit so that that thing isn't blocking them. I know that'll be a little annoying, but it'll be better this way. All right, that's better. Once upon a time there was a man who died, which which we have had before. And it's also uh, Ein Sturben, Ein Mal, yeah, right? Or Ein Starb. Uh, the story was interrupted, and along with his heart, the prince lost his kindness and even his memories of having fought so bravely. And the shards find their way into the voids of the heart, which I talked about. Good. Then we get our introduction in the midst of the storybook portion to Ebin. How does, oh shit, we have to talk about that first. Okay, so the first thing that we really need to talk about is the recontextualization of the entire opening segments. All of the opening segments. Um, they are now very different because they're real. What do I mean? They're also not real. They're also fake and also a lie. So, so we picked up on the, I'm now going to call it a fact, that the opening segments are not only changing but being rewritten. Um, not just because we're gaining more information, but because specifically different information is being chosen to be imparted. A different way of introducing the story is being tested or tried by Drosselmeyer, I think. So that intro is not the thing. A dream. It's about a dream I had. And then she explains her dream. Mm-hmm. So the entire introductory monologue was imparted to Ahiru in a dream. So the story of the Prince and the Raven exists as a book in the world, a dream of information imparted to Ahiru that grants her her motivations, right? And the, like, legitimate story where there were living living things in it where the prince and the raven were and the prince is now removed from that place right okay if if she has all that information then that means that drosselmeyer fed her all that information right because she doesn't she doesn't know that it's a real book in the world right Everyone else does, but she doesn't. So she wouldn't have ever been able to read it. She has only heard of it from Drosselmeyer. And now she considers it a dream. So it means that the opening information to us is as solid as that. Which is to say not at all. Because like Drosselmeyer is, is a storyteller. If it suits him to tell to tell Ahiru and to tell us, the audience, that there was a story before and that's just the setup for this story, then he can do that and it doesn't have to be true. At all. Oh boy. Okay, I've mentioned this a couple times over the course of this video. This is the constant, like, the constant drumbeat of their relationship with Ahiru. They're outwardly kind to her and, like, helping her, but at the same time, they're totally and completely and always undercutting her and, like, she'll never become one. She'll never become anything. Kind of shitty. I also really like some of the framing of these sequences. Like, all of this stuff is fun, um, but then once they start, like, moving in and out of frame in clever and fun ways, jumping back away, and or not moving in and out of frame, in and out of depth of field in interesting ways, and, like, framing us around the Ahoge is super fun. Jumping in and getting really, really ominous. As she's, like, backing up away from them, right? That's super fun. So, the other thing here is that she has, she has rephrased the entirety of the story to fit the way that she wants the story to go, right? The prince is this, he can seal that, he did this, and then there's also Princess Tutu, and that's me, and I'm gonna go and then do a thing, and it'll be great. And when she reimagines the story, it's in her own, in her own mind, in her own way, in her own light. 
and she imagines the happy ending. It's interesting. And we mentioned loneliness. Uh-huh. And they've heard that story before. And then they take the fucking book. Bastards. By Drosselmeyer. Oh no. The raven is like a serpent. That's really interesting. Two books would be impossible for you. So she asks the question and suddenly everything changes. What? He died ages ago. Wonder if we're gonna get more and more ominous with these characters, kinda like the Shadow Girls. Get a little creepy with it. I'm down. I'm super into that. I think he died while writing the book. Something that strange. And suddenly we're framing her within the box, within the cage, right? We talked about this in the OP. When she's looking out that window, it's almost like looking out from within a bird cage. Here it's very much the same, just the top of the arch. And it's throughout. Like, once Fakir arrives, everything is caged, and we shoot from the other side a couple times. Yeah, we, f we frame her face all in, all, all in isolating stuff. Up in, up in that corner, isolating stuff. They're outside, she's inside, all that. She even lowers herself into a, a more isolated cage as she stares out at what she cannot have and tells herself that she cannot have it. Ah, slumping and slumping further and further and further down into little and littler, littler pieces. Until Fakir's just like, sup, I'm here to be a dickhead right now. <laughs> He's so much. He's so extra. <sighs> He's with Rue? <sighs> also, I really like that there's this mirror in the background here. It, it makes his pitter-patter across this, uh, his angry walk ominous walk wonderful and then the the from below shot and then the loom you're lying oh my god dude and again framed within bars caged by something i think that works for fakir too right he seems to be somebody who's very restricted and we don't know why exactly i also really think he's the knight now that he's shown up on a fucking horse that kind of leans into that idea okay ahiru is Ahiru is really wondering about the nature of her reality now, and I love it. I love it, because that's what we need. We need her to become an actively, like, aware character. Like, we just learned that she is an aware character, right? That she has been, through a dream, imparted with the same, I guess, exposition that we get at the beginning of the episode, and probably, like, that's her dream every night that she has while she's a duck or whatever, before re-entering her human world life. Ah. Uh, so she's not just a character within a play. She's a character within a, within a play who knows the script. The character knows the script, not the actor. The character knows their script. Can she change it? If stories can change the world, can she change the story? I think so. And the reason that I think so is may those who accept their fate be granted happiness. May those who de defy their fate be granted glory. Okay, we find out, this is jumping ahead a bit, but we find out at the end of the episode from Drosselmeyer's own mouth that the story of, or really it's from Rue as well, but then Drosselmeyer sort of steps in to confirm uh, that Princess Tutu is a tragic character who cannot get love from prince whose love she she seeks right we find we find that out that is her fate then right the fate of princess tutu is to never receive that particular love but those who accept their fate can find happiness theory half half a season <laughs> takes 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 a full core to get there but tutu Ahiru finally realizes that Mitho is not the, the dude for her. So she confesses her love. He goes, nah, fam, and she gets anti-tutu'd or whatever. But learns to be content with it because it wasn't right anyway. And ends up with Fakir. That's why he's fucking there while she's a duck standing over the duck pond because he actually cares about her and they fall in love.
so she can accept her fate and find happiness. And then maybe there will be a new plot element and we we got to go got to worry about defying fate and finding glory a bit later, a different fate. I think I'm onto something. I don't know what, but I think I'm onto something. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. Do you believe him? I ask because I honestly don't know if I do. Like, does he know about Mito and that he's the from the tale? I think so. I think he does, and I think he realizes the power of, of books and such. Okay. What's that? Something in Wald, which is in the forest? Uh, the Old Woman in the Wood. A German fairy tale collected by the Brothers Grimm. So it is a, it is a witch in the woods story. Is it Hansel and Gretel, essentially? No, it is different. Okay. Oh, one sec. Uh, it's a really weird one. Something so oh, it's fucking weird. I mean, it, it has some shit to it. Um, synopsis. A beautiful but poor servant girl traveled, blah, blah, blah. Robbers attack them. She hides behind a tree. No one else survives. She laments her, lends her fate, and a dove comes to her with a golden key. The dove tells her to unlock a tree, and she finds food there and stays in the tree for a while. She lives like that for many days. The dove asks her for a favor in exchange. It tells her to go to a particular house and go in. There's an old woman who will greet her, greet her but she should not answer. She should just continue, open an inner door, which will re reveal a room full of beautiful, glimmering rings, but she should take a plain, simple one. The old woman is super angry, but the girl doesn't heed her or talk to her. Then, she can't see the plain ring, so she, but she sees the old woman trying to carry off a birdcage. She takes the birdcage away from her. It holds a bird, which holds the ring in its beak, so she takes it outside and waits against a tree. The tree turns into a handsome man who kisses her, and then tells her that the old woman was a witch who had turned him into a tree. And for two hours a day, he became a dove, and ha she had freed him. So he used his two hours of being a dove to like show her niceness. All his attendants turned back from trees into humans as well. With the prince being a king's son, they went to his father's kingdom and then got married with a happily ever after. Fucking what? So there's a dude who was turned into a tree by a witch, and he can turn into a dove as part of his curse for two hours every day. And he uses that time to make friends with a lady, and then, then have the lady go and free him from the witch, which she does willingly. And he turns back into a, a, a human from being a tree. Huh. That's really interesting. There aren't that many stories like this where the beautiful but poor servant girl saves the prince. Like, kissing the frog is one. And, and that's a pretty good one. But this is, like, almost Sleeping Beauty-esque in that there's this trapped prince and the female character saves him seems moderately relevant for a story about a female character who turns from a bird into a human saving a prince who who like is fucked <laughs> okay uh i'm into it that's a little weird but i'm into it so i'm the only one who knows about it and we blank her out and put her behind even more layers of boxes and cages and bars just more and more and more locked in there with the storybook whoa gosh the 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 just the the general design of the character and the way that she is drawn and the care put into the lines and the mouth movements and the the head turns and such is so fucking awesome all right let's go listen to everything that adel says truth is a shy little thing if you approach it oh yeah the adel reveal was dope <laughs> Nope. It's like, okay, this is another thing that this show is doing, and it's doing a lot. It's like we're, we're intentionally being drawn away from the, 
the actually amazingly interesting things that Adel says by the weird visuals that occur around her and just the weirdness of her. Like, we're so entranced by where's Adel that it's hard to even pay attention to what she's really saying. I think that's kind of neat. Also, hi, little d d dude with the what? Huh? I don't know. Having doubts about yourself and your place in a story, maybe? And I have no idea what that means. Wind and flames and trees and stuff. Super weird. Okay. Uh, Their picnic is really weird, too. It's kind of like over-the-top picture-perfect. And it's all a facade. Right? It's the one flowering tree. There are literally petals falling almost as though it's for them. They've got grapes and sandwiches and and food and french fries and, I don't know, more sandwiches and, and cheese wedges and a bottle of some kind of, I guess it's probably lemonade or something. Okay. And then there's this, this moving, turning shot that's as idyllic as it can possibly be. It's, like, perfect. And then we find out how their relationship works. And it's really weird. She seems to like commanding him to do stuff. Um, and he clearly doesn't care because he can't, but there's an element to that that's really fucked up, right? Like he, he literally cannot consent to this at all. <laughs> I don't like it. I'm thirsty. Here, have a drink. She pours it all out. Why? Does she just delight in making him do things? Almost, this almost reminds me of like... The intro of The Princess Bride, where she's, like, taking taking things off of shelves and, like, throwing them on the floor and, like, Farm boy, go pick that shit up for me. I'm gonna stare at your butt while you do it. Nice. <laughs> it's so weird. I don't, I don't understand why I pour out the lemonade. I guess just to really accent that there's no need for her to be doing this. She's just, just likes making him do things, like having a play thing or, like, a play toy, kind of. Almost a little bit like a Drosselmeyer, like wanting to have control over characters or control over other people. That's odd. It's very odd. Huh. Okay, and then there's this cut. I, I mentioned it before, but I think it's really awesome. Some people have, have mentioned these flippity flippity flips a few times. Um, I thought that they look a lot like pages turning. Just flip, flip, flip. But they're not really. Someone said that they, they look to them like what you might use as a transition if you were looking into a space via a crystal ball or like looking in via a snow globe. So maybe we're in Drosselmeyer's type of perspective. It's possible. Um, or ripples in water was another one that came up a couple times. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I do just want to say I think this cut is f fucking awesome. Uh, all the foreshortening is so perfect. And then the three separate parallax backgrounds moving in different... I, I've never seen anything quite like it, and it's really awesome. Okay. They really are perfect for each other, but they didn't look like they were having much fun. Interesting that you would think that, Ahiru, because I came to the same conclusion, and yeah, that was a weird conversation they were having there. Does not seem like a healthy relationship. Okay, we, we do get some nice and goofies. But they're they're contextually weird, you know. And hi, Mito. Now our story starts. And of course, more more fun and goofies. She's oh god. Probably. What do you mean you probably love Ruchan? Well, because he doesn't. He's just commanded to say it. And then there's this. He needs people to tell him what to do has no autonomy that didn't really even click for me just like how vegetative he really is jesus well we're giving back pain to him so we'll have some i don't know how that's gonna go and he literally does not feel pain this really helps understand fakir i think if, if Fakir cares about Mito and Mito just gets himself hurt all the time like an idiot or gets taken advantage of constantly by people like Rue, I could very much understand why Fakir would be a little bit short with him. A little, a little angry sometimes. 
And beyond that, there's absolutely no way to communicate, really. Uh, he doesn't get gestures or emotions or any of that. You can't convey that to someone who has no experience of it. So, and yes, it is a weird face. It's very fun. So again, she's thinking about the, the core ramifications of everything that she's just learned. Oh, it's a lot. So, this is a pretty good little set of, of, of elements brought together. He's out to get water. He goes and gets the water. She pours the water on his hand, informing us that he doesn't feel pain, and showing her desire to help him, and doing so, and being the plot point that forces them to wander further and find more water. Of course, they could have just gone to wherever the hell Mito first went to get water, but mm, we just walk. It doesn't really matter. Oh, yeah, she grabs the bottle without noticing. That's what it is. Sumimasen, Sumimasen grabs the bottle and pulls him along with, and he just goes along with. And we frame him out of frame in every single possible way that we can to make the gag work. I didn't even really catch that, but we do. Because we're in her head, and she doesn't realize that Mito is with her because she'd be freaking out if she was, if she was aware. <laughs> And behind the tree. <laughs> ah! <laughs> okay, so we arrive. And it is very much the cottage in the woods. It's not good. Not good. Very much going into the Hansel and Gretel type of stuff. And the creepy witch. But she's actually wonderful and actually means well. Of course, the show's not going to tell us that immediately. The show's going to go bonkers crazy into making her creepy. Uh, dark shadows in the corners, dark shadows in the other corner, dark shadows in the other corner, dark shadows everywhere, vignetting, dark shadows, dark shadows, dark shadows, creepy girl, dark shaded face, also eat my food. And we accent this cut. Yeah, we accent this cut where she turns because it's physical contact with her. Uh. Yeah. Make that one really brilliant and smooth. And it is. It's good. Uh, shrimp pate, uh, ebin, ebi, shrimp. Hmm. Well, you are going to find out about the shards. Okay. I'm on a horse. Uh, we also do this, this dope as fuck pan up. Um, and when he first arrives, all we see is the white clad foot. Knight in shining armor type of thing. White knight on a dark horse. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I think Fokker is a knight. I think Fokker is the knight that appears in the clock. I don't know what the fuck that means. He's still a douchehead right now, but, you know, that's fine. So they kind of snarkily argue about possessiveness, and we get the, the implication that they're both fully aware of the situation. I think Fokker is fully aware. I think Rue is fully aware because she knows about telling him stuff. But she's not from the story, is she? Unless she's like the raven or something. And neither is Fakir. Weird. What makes them different? Because they, they seem really different from everybody else. And I don't know why. They also seem to be begrudgingly aligned. Right? Mewtoga. <laughs> That little side eye. And then, like, suddenly, shit's, shit's serious, and we're not letting our personal hatred of each other get in the way of making sure that things are not going in a certain direction, right? She immediately, like, reveals what she was holding back before. I don't know where Muto is. He says, he mentioned feeling and gives her the side eye. She goes, what? Okay, he went, he went off to go get some water. Go. I hate you, but do what we gotta do. That's the vibe that I've got here. So are, they're like in this together, even though they don't see eye to eye. And I get the feeling like Fakir doesn't like the way that Rue treats Mito, and Rue doesn't seem to really care the other way. Just doesn't like Fakir, it seems. Who else would he be going with? Well... And then this isn't like you at all. What are you so frantic about? So they're quite they're quite familiar with each other. And off he goes. 
And she does come with. Okay, so the food comes. It's all cold. It sucks. It's the worst. And it makes sense why once we get the actual thematic, like, everything. I love the sequence that leads into the creepy, uh, where she, quote-unquote, goes to the restroom and then hears some stuff to check on some stuff. I have to have them eat even more. I wonder which will taste better compared to you. Talking about the dishes and and which would be any good compared to her to her husband. Aww. There's also an element here of like she was constantly reaching to try to compare her own creations to those of her husband, as opposed to putting her effort into creating them herself, right? And now there's no point of comparison, so she's lost that. Doesn't have that to, to branch off of. Aww. That's so, it's so well done. It's so intricate, you know? And yeah, a grave. And the name on it, Omoto. Yeah. This is fun. Uh, I, I think it's pretty clear to us at this point that this is just, just pushing into this direction. But then this is the interesting part. The Witch in the Woods story, or the Hansel and Gretel story, it exists in their world. How many other fairy tales exist in their world? And if this is a fairy tale or a tale or a story that's gone awry, are there others? Probably. Probably. It's also positing that the witch in the woods who did all of those things might not have been a sinister character, but a broken character. And I think that's really interesting. You know, if we posit that Ebene is a real person in however real the world of our maiden story is. Uh, she's becoming like a fairy tale witch because of events in her life and the insidious shard of loneliness. That posits that, that it is trauma and lack of understanding from those around you that leads to, that leads to the monsters of folklore. Which I think is really interesting while I'm currently watching Natsume Yujinjo, a show about how, like, trauma and lack of communication causes yokai to become evil and, and have problems. <laughs> it's pretty... Hmm. Hmm. Some parallels. Hmm. But she knows the story. Okay, so we find the thing that should be the reveal, right? When you find the thing that the witch doesn't want you to find out about, suddenly she drops her form and and eats you and throws you in the oven or whatever. But no, this is instead that we reveal what's really going on. I mean, she tries. She she tries to witch it up. I see. You eat. And it is at this point... It's going awry. The story is going awry. But it isn't, is it? Because Drosselmeyer made this happen, right? This is exactly the story that he wants. He's just saying to his character with imperfect knowledge of this world, it's, it's wrong, you have to fix it. It's wrong, you have to fix it. What are you going to do? You got to fix it. Who's going to do it? Princess Tutu is. Who are you? Dancing around with glee. manufacturing problems in order to insert drama into the tale. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, Dross. Okay, Drossy boy. A heart that is too pure is a heavy burden. Yes, indeed. And then he presents it to her as a challenge. How will you handle this story? It, it is different, right? I'm just gonna open episode two really quickly. Yeah, okay. So they're they're different every time. I assume there's a relevance to that. I'm gonna go try to find out what that song is. Um, somebody did let me know that there is like a page on the Wikipedia page for each episode that contains the list of songs that are in it, which helps narrow things down quite a bit. So I'm gonna use that. Um, and go find it. Okay, it is Panorama from Sleeping Beauty.
That's the song. I just don't know if, if there's any like meaning to it. Necessarily. Can't say. I can't say. Okay. We manifest awesome vines and stuff. Trap Mito in a safe cage. Dance amongst the thorns, which I feel like is really cool. Yeah, obsession with the job. And um, something that this sequence of offering compassion and kindness and understanding, crucially understanding, and the way that, that Princess Tutu or Ahiru does that, is so strong in this episode. I think I think this one does it a lot better than episode two. Partly because we care about this character more, I think. I think Auntie Darina spent too much time being kind of fucky, like not cool. Whereas this character, we understand from the outset that like this is a traumatized individual who's dealing with something and we can fix it. And she means ultra well, right? Like super well. She just wants to feed people really well. And make good food. Every time that that she makes that Ahiru like makes some serious statement, she expresses it through the ballet. And the really cool thing there is that like ballet already is doing that. There are conversations occurring in every ballet between the dancers, and they are very literally expressing things. You can imagine this portion, this portion in particular, where she dance forward reach out, dance forward, reach out, and uh, uh, I believe Ebbing, like, freezes and steps, yeah, right? You can imagine this as part of, like, an opera or part of a ballet, right? One one character going like this and the other one going, hmm, hmm, away from them, right? You can see that on the stage occurring in your mind, can't you? Why? Why? No, I'm stubborn. No, I'm stubborn. But now we're doing it the other way around, where we're taking the script and also expressing it through dance. This is a fucking a cool. Then we get our, our, our repetitive lines. This person's heart is not where you belong. Let's go back. And then, nope, he's mine. And then manifest a gigantic black uh, uh, swan boat. I don't know what the deal is with that uh, or why we do that. But we do, and it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And again, gestures for everything. Like, she's dancing through it. R requesting pose, like, why? Why is this the case? Why the food? What's the deal? And the camera, the camera follows the motions for each thing that she's doing. Associating this line with this motion. In prison. And then a desperation to feel, to understand, to reach out, to connect. Kimochi. And they meet in the middle. Dark and light intersect, and they dance together. She remembers all the joy that there was there. Not just the, the loneliness that hurts. No one left to tease me. Framing the picture, weeping, grief. I can't really tell what's going on here. I feel like she's apologizing for bad food or for spilling food on the person. I think apologizing for bad food. And then an empty, empty restaurant. An opportunity, a void. Now I understand. You're not alone. And we manifest it from the, from the lotus. Wow. I love this line. The power to turn loneliness into strength. I talked about it already, but man, I love that line. Because <laughs> that's a human power. It really is. I think, I, think, I think there are like two ways, broadly, that humans respond to trauma. Whatever form that is, whether it's abuse or death of somebody you care about or whatever. 
either we withdraw and fail and give into it and become overcome by it and are torn apart by it, or we break and reforge ourselves. We turn our trauma into strength. We fill in the cracks with something stronger. Kintsugi. It's the entire thematic thrust of, of Hoseki no Kuni. <laughs> Go read Hoseki no Kuni or watch it. It's, it's really good. Just saying. It's the entire thematic thrust of that show is, is breaking and reforging. Loneliness into strength. This is also deeply resonant with my personal beliefs. Take your trauma, turn it into your power. And it's a, a uniquely human thing. And it's something that, that sometimes we need a little bit of help to get a little bit of the extra trauma out of us. Because sometimes there's just too much poison in our system to do it ourselves. Ooh, that's, that's heavy. That's, that's good, good stuff. Not good times, but good stuff. He stops her and pulls her back. Thank you, Princess Tutu. He knows who Princess Tutu is. And so does Rue. Ridiculous. That's just a story. So maybe Rue doesn't know that Mito is a prince from a story. Because if she did, then that's just a story wouldn't make any sense. Stories can be anywhere, right? So that means that the story of Princess Tutu also exists as a book in this world, yes? Wait, then... Uh... Uh, what? All right, I, I can't, I cannot wrap my head around that one right now. I, I'm already having trouble wrapping my head on like the dream layers that are implied by her saying that the dream at the beginning. That's just a story, but then, well, would you put die? So is she living out a story that's already been told? Is Drosselmeyer just mix and matching two stories together? In order to try to make a more interesting one? Kind of. I mean, he just intersected our story with... With, with the Hensel and Gretel woman in the woods, right? So why not? An already written story of Princess Tutu? A character that doesn't know that she's... Locked into a particular fate and isn't supposed to know that? Who finds it out by chance? Whoa. Okay. But how's that possible? Because Tutu's not part of that story. Blessed with beauty, cleverness, and strength, but fated never to be with her prince. Yeah, fate comes up. Turns into a speck of light and vanishes. Quack, and into a duck she goes. Tragic princess. Not only are they not always guaranteed a happily ever after, I think Drosselmeyer actively seeks darker stories. Which, again, I do too. I might want good things for these characters, but that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily opposed to making them suffer for the purpose of a good story. Ooh, shit's interesting. I think the biggest takeaway from this episode is that Ahiru is becoming a lot more aware. Um, Self-aware and aware of her position within her world and her relative position of lack of power uh, in general, except as she expresses it via Princess Tutu. The problem is that she is not... Like, she doesn't make the choice, really, to go Princess Tutu. She, she does. She has to trigger the transformation or whatever Drosselmeyer has to push her toward it but the whole universe is conspired to push her in a particular direction always and she has not ever tried to do anything else so when do we start rejecting our fate when do we start trying to change things when do we break out of this cycle I don't know but I, I'm so looking forward to trying I'm so looking forward to seeing Ahiru try and probably get fucked up by it. Because you do not fuck with God. You don't disobey God. What happens if, if a character in your story starts acting out of turn? 
I don't know. Maybe he'll just be delighted by that, right? Maybe that's what he really wants. I don't know, man. I don't know. I want to know more about Rue. That's that's the other thing. Rue and Fakir are, are very rapidly continuing to be the most interesting characters in this show. Adel is going to be a voice of the narrator, sort of, uh, and say cryptic shit. Great. Drosselmeyer, he might as well be God. He's going to say weird biblical shit that doesn't make any sense, and does, but doesn't. And also, you know, instigate the transformations and stuff. Fakir and Rue, they're on their own. They're different and weird, but they're working together, and they both seem to know about Mito, but also they don't seem to know about Mito. <gasps> okay. I want to know a lot more about them right now. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we're coming up on another two-hour recording here. I don't know how many breaks I took, but, uh, wowzers. I, I, I feel like I have not done justice to this episode, frankly, and I feel like I need to go and rewatch it and see if I uh, come to, I don't know, more concise and coherent uh, ways to convey what I think about this episode. I will say that I'm really intrigued by this episode. I love that Ahiru is gaining some awareness of her state and her position in this world, and potentially learning things that she might not be, be supposed to know in the context of the now seemingly shattered story of Princess Tutu, as well as the shattered story of the Prince and the Raven. Because it seems like Drosselmeyer is mixing and matching his tales, and that's fucking weird, dude. Anyway, I'm excited. We're gonna call it there. Me, Tiabu. This Princess Tutu... We just found out that our character is slated for a bad fate and going to turn into a speck of dust and disappear if she ever confesses her love directly to Mito. Ooh, hoo, hoo, that's bad. That's bad. Maybe we'll find a way to uh, gain happiness by accepting our fate and gain glory by rejecting it. We'll see. <laughs> that's going to be it for me. Tia boo. Tutu. See you next week for more. Peace.